Good morning, everybody. My name is Jerry DiMaggio. Uh, welcome to today's ARA Webinar Wednesday program. I'll be serving as the moderator, uh, handling the Q&A program and introducing our speaker. Those of you who are new to the webinar series, we've been doing this since February of this year, and we do it, uh, offer a diverse range of topics on about a monthly or four to five week basis. Uh, so we have different skill sets from our varied offices. I reside in our Delaware office. And today's topic is pavement marking management. Our speaker who I'll give an a introduction to in a few slides, moving on, is uh, Carmen Dwyer. Carmen resides in our Champaign-Urbana office in Illinois. And uh, today's program is about 60 minutes in length. It'll consist of about 40, 45 minutes of presentation, and then following that, we'll have a Q&A period. And I'll give you, at the conclusion of the program, uh, a little bit of an insight in terms of what our, our programs are going to be in November and December. So next slide, please. So just a few housekeeping items. Uh, you have an availability of a chat uh, with our uh, our coordinators, uh, Heidi Rockwood, address that to Heidi. If you have some technical matters that need to be addressed, first thing that we do ask is that you check at your site, make sure if you have audio or visual difficulties uh, that that is being handled at your site and you don't have a problem there before you reach out to Heidi and we'll, we'll take care of any problems that might be encountered. We've been quite fortunate since February to not have uh, really any problems whatsoever. Next slide, please. So we encourage you to ask a question. Uh, as I mentioned before, we'll be deferring the Q&A period to the conclusion of the program. And Carmen has been kind enough to share her email address, which you'll see a bit later. And she'll entertain questions really on this particular topic to close a business on Friday. And that's kind of our standard protocol for handling Q&A. As many people who join the webinars have difficulty watching the slide, being attentive to the speaker, and then formulating a question. Next slide, please. So a bit about Carmen. See, there she is out in the field. She has advanced degrees uh, in civil engineering. Uh, she has been in practice for 20 years. And uh, one of her primary focus areas during the, the last 13 years is been on this uh, topic of pavement marking, both research and also from a consulting side. And uh, personally, if you think of this topic, and many of you may be specialists in the areas as well, you want to learn more, of course, but it's, it's an emerging area that's gaining really almost on a weekly basis more and more interest by the transportation agencies and their stakeholders, respectively. So uh, Karma is going to be sharing some of her experiences with uh, us today. She's worked uh, in Illinois, uh, been a significant um, consultant and contributor to the Illinois Tollway uh, Authority for a number of years. She's also done work in the pavement marking management area in Arizona, Missouri, Michigan, and West Virginia. And last of all, Carmen is uh, currently the chair of the Transportation Research Board's Committee on signing and marking materials. So with that, I'll turn it over to Carmen. You'll hear more from me later on at the conclusion of the technical program. Okay, thank you, Jerry, and hello, everyone. For my uh, presentation today, I'll begin with discussing what payment marking management is. While transportation agencies can have different uh, management approaches, there are three main components that all of them will have in common. And next, I'll review three reasons why a transportation agency would want to have a payment marking management system. And then I'll spend most of the presentation going over in, in some detail examples of two state DOT payment marking management systems. Now, one is more about the preparations for a management system, and the other is about the details and uh, results of a fully operational pavement marking management system. So what is pavement marking management? 
As shown here, any asset management system has three main components. First, uh, you must begin with an inventory of your assets. Many agencies already know the number of centerline miles of pavement they may have and likely know how many lane miles of lane miles of pavement as well, but the number of pavement marking lane miles is likely different than the number of pavement lane miles. For instance, on a two-lane highway, there may be a center line and two edge lines, which means that there are 50% more line miles of markings than lane miles of pavement. So the, the quantities will need to be determined. But once the quantities of the asset are recorded, then other attributes such as marking installation date and marking type, if available, uh, can be added to the inventory data set. The second component that any asset management system will have is a method for measuring the condition of the asset. So for pavement markings, there is one common metric that is used for measuring marking condition, and that's retroreflectivity. It's also the only metric that there is a standard test method for, and I'll describe that in my next slide. Uh, the third and final component is a maintenance plan or a set of criteria or threshold values at which the condition level is considered failed and the marking needs to be restriped. So the graphic I've presented here is a snapshot of a pavement marking condition data set where the failed sections uh, have been identified for restriping. So as mentioned on the, the previous slide, the metric for a marking condition is pavement marking retro uh, reflectivity, and this is a measure of how much light from a vehicle's headlamps reflect off the beads that are embedded in the pavement marking material and return back to the driver's eyes. Uh, ASTM 7, E1710 standardizes this measurement by setting a specified height for the headlight above the pavement surface, as well as a specified height for the driver's eye above the pavement surface, and a specified distance to the glass bead, and as shown here, that's 30 meters. Also as shown, this creates a specific entrance angle, that's the 88.76 degrees, and an observance angle, which is the 1.05 degree angle. And the entire test method is referred to as the 30 meter geometry requirements, which as long as these two angles that are shown um, are remain, that is scalable. So the, the measurements uh, of retroreflectivity are made by either a, a handheld or a mobile retroreflectometer, but at a smaller scale, maintaining the 30 meter geometry. So moving on to why pavement marking management would be important to an agency. I'm going to provide three reasons. And the first is that there is a proposed amendment to the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices for requiring pavement markings to be maintained at or above a minimum retroreflectivity level. So many years ago, Congress mandated that minimum retroreflectivity requirements be set for both traffic signs and markings. The requirement for signs was set first, and then in 2010, a notice of proposed amendment was published for payment markings in the Federal Register. The proposed requirements received about 100 responses, and since then, the Federal Highway Administration reviewed those responses and has made updates to the schedule for providing a revised or supplemental notice of proposed amendment, and in 2017, the SNPA was published and responses were received for it as well. And on the next slide are the proposed requirements in the SNPA. Now for the sake of time, I'm just presenting the current proposal, but the original NPA was a bit more complex and the required levels uh, were higher. But as shown, the current proposed amendment would set a standard for roads with posted speed limits of 30 miles per hour or greater to be maintained at or above a retroflectivity of 50 millicandelas per meter squared per lux. And there would also be guidance, which is a should statement, not a 
shall statement that roads with posted speed limits of 70 miles per hour or greater be maintained at or above 100 millicandelas. So agencies would be required to have a, a method in place for maintaining longitudinal markings at or above the standard, and the SMPA also lists uh, some recommended uh, methods. As an update uh, for everyone, I was uh, recently in communication with a representative from the FHWA Office of Safety and learned that they intend to announce a revised schedule to the publishing to publishing the final rule sometime this fall. So uh, if interested, you'll want to stay tuned for that. While amending the MUTCD is aimed at making sure markings are visible to human drivers, there is a newer demand, and it's also a pretty hot topic, for connected and autonomous vehicles to be able to see markings as well. The graphic uh, here, <clears throat> the graphic you see here was produced by Auburn University as part of a literature review and surveys uh, <clears throat> they conducted under contract with the American Traffic Safety Services Association. Uh, what they gathered is that out of many roadway assets, CAVs are going to have the highest impact or the greatest demand on pavement markings. So this is, this is pretty important to anybody who needs to maintain markings. And while fully automated cars aren't uh, found everywhere just yet, uh, many of today's vehicles already have features that use machine vision technology, features such as lane departure warning, uh, lane keeping assist, lane change assist, and automatic parking are just a few. Uh, but these all require good quality markings to function correctly uh, today. The third reason I'm giving for having a pavement marking management system kind of piggybacks on the objective for adding a minimum retroflectivity standard to the MUTCD, and that's to make roadways safe at night. Uh, but my third reason is also that even without a federally mandated requirement, it's just the right thing to do. Uh, for the vast majority of our roadway environment, the only thing providing information about lane position or, or edge of uh, pavement uh, during nighttime conditions are pavement markings. And the image uh, provided here shows some, some good quality markings, but you can imagine how uh, dangerous uh, this curve would be to travel at night at highway speeds if the markings were barely visible. So now for uh, the pavement marking management examples. As I mentioned earlier, the SNPA includes recommended maintenance methods, and the examples I'm about to share represent two of those methods. So the first example is from the Illinois Department of Transportation, and it represents the expected service life maintenance method in which uh, markings are scheduled for replacement based on the expected service life. So about 10 years ago, ARA began a pavement marking research study for the Illinois DOT. The title of the project was Evaluating the Compatibility, Durability, and Visibility of Pavement Markings on Various Pavement Surfaces, and the objective of the study was to develop a pavement marking selection guide to serve as a reference to the districts for selecting the optimum marking materials for their location. Now, optimum marking materials were defined as those that are compatible with a site, provide an appropriate service life, and are cost effective. So you can see where I'm going with how this is related, but for this study, uh, we evaluated marking materials at sites all over the state, and the final deliverables were matrices with recommended uh, marking types and their respective service lives. So. While the study's primary objective was the marking guide, uh, the final deliverable had the added benefit of providing a key component uh, to a maintenance method. In the next several slides, I'm going to describe uh, the work involved to get to that final product. So the first step was to identify the types of markings to evaluate. And working uh, with the technical review panel, 
six uh, marking types were selected. There were paint, thermal plastic, tape, and three plural component systems, epoxy, polyurea, and urethane. There were five test site variables considered in the study, traffic volume, climate, contract type, pavement surface type, and type of surface application. So for traffic volume, it was decided to evaluate at a high and a low ADT, and the 7,000 threshold uh, you see here was uh, based on a general observation of where there tended to be a, a, a trend of most uh, traffic volumes being above or below that value. Uh, there, <clears throat> for considering different climate zones, a, a snowfall contour map from the Midwest Regional Climatology Center was superimposed over the district and county map as shown here on the right. Uh, the contours uh, represent the average number of days per year with snowfall at or above one inch. So the 10-day uh, contour line happened to be at a similar location to Interstate 80. So I-80 was considered to be the boundary between northern and central Illinois. And the six-day contour <clears throat> line is at a similar location to Interstate uh, 70. So I-70 was considered to be the boundary between central and southern Illinois. The contract types desired for the study's evaluation were both uh, new construction and maintenance striping. Both asphalt and concrete surface roads were desired, as well as both surface and recessed applications. And the photo uh, here is an example of a recess marking. So you can see a groove was cut into the pavement uh, before the marking was placed. So uh, <clears throat> once all the marking types and the variables, the, the variables determined uh, for evaluation, uh, we worked with a couple members of the TRP uh, to identify sites that met this criteria. So through the winter and spring, uh, we identified numerous maintenance and construction contracts that met the desired uh, test site criteria for each of the material types. But in the table shown here, uh, the cells that are highlighted in gray represent the desired evaluation criteria for each of the marking types. So it was a long list, but we, we got through it. Um, and at the end of the test site selection, there were a total of 66 sites. So the table here summarizes the distribution of those 66 sites amongst the variables. So for instance, for the uh, ADT of the 66 sites, 52 were a high traffic volume and 14 of them were low. And then uh, moving down the, the table to climate, of the 66 sites, 29 were in the northern part of the state, 26 were in the central, and 11 were in the southern. So, And then the map to the right here depicts all the test site locations. So you see we're able to uh, get a pretty good distribution uh, from the north to the south end of the state as well as east to west. So the two metrics uh, used to perform annual evaluations, there were two metrics uh, used to perform annual evaluations on the markings. And the first metric, as already described, was retroreflectivity. But I've um, also included here a photo of the handheld retroreflectometer that was used for the study. The second metric was uh, presence, and presence is a measurement of the percent of a marking material that remains bonded to the pavement surface. Um, and this is a reflection of the marking's durability. And for this metric, we used a binary image analysis program that we developed. Uh, photos were taken with a camera attached to a what we call a photo box, as shown here, for standardizing the photos, and then the photos were process through the analysis program. So as shown in the screenshot, the image uh, that was taken is converted to a binary image of pixels. So the red pixels uh, represent the missing material, and the pixels of both colors are counted, and the white pixels divided, count divided by the total pixel count to 
to calculate the presence. So the two metrics are combined into one index, a pavement marking index, which is also developed by ARA. And if anyone's interested, as, as Jerry mentioned earlier, my, my email will be provided at the end, but I can provide a great uh, deal more information um, later if you, if you desire to know more about how this was developed. But the PMI is an objective and repeatable method for combining these two metrics. And that um, was developed around the times that that original MPA that I mentioned was published. So the retroreflectivity thresholds uh, for failure in the PMI correspond to limits described uh, in the NPA. So for the study, a PMI value of 60 was considered the markings end of service life, uh, shown in this graph of PMI over time for thermoplastics uh, installed on new construction contracts. Many of the markings had not reached the end of their service life uh, after the third and final winter, which is at the end of the study. So as you can see, that's where the, the points on the lines stop. So from there, we had to make just a conservative estimate uh, to project uh, the remaining service lives for some of the markings. And here's one more example of PMI projections for another marking type. This plot represents the performance of urethane that was installed through maintenance contracts. So the uh, red line here, of course, indicates the failure threshold, the end of service life. Um, but for the example we're showing here for urethane 7B, it follows that line to this point, uh, you'll see that the, uh, the marking had an end of service life of about 3.25 years. So after all the service uh, life determinations were made or evaluated, uh, we then calculated the annualized cost for every marking um, given the current uh, cost at that time, which the end of the study was 2013. And we also included for those that were recessed, uh, that installation cost of course included uh, the cost of uh, place the groove in the, in the pavement. And then uh, the, the, the major component of the guide, which is what I'm about to present, are four selection matrices. Uh, they were striping on uh, new asphalt construction, striping on new concrete construction, and then both uh, maintenance striping on both asphalt and concrete. So in the next several slides, I'm going to show in detail just the first one, the striping on uh, a new asphalt pavement, and then just briefly show the other three. And, how they differ uh, from the first selection table. So each of the four uh, selection tables contains three categories, and these, of course, are representing the, the variables that we studied through the study, um, <clears throat> evaluated through the study. The first is climate zone. So, of course, there's the, north, the northern, the central, and southern zones for the state. The second um, category is traffic, which is then uh, broken out to, of course, the lower the high traffic volume. And the third category would be application type. So here you can see we've uh, separated it into surface versus uh, a recessed application. And then all of the products that uh, we recommend for each of these scenarios um, uh, for that category are listed in the, the cells here that's shown that's highlighted or circled in red, um, but they are listed from the lowest annualized cost to the highest. So in the example shown here, when you need to select a marking type for a new asphalt pavement, in, the north, in northern Illinois on a roadway with high ADT, the options for surface application are thermoplastic, epoxy, polyurea, preformed plastic, and urethane. So the first set of numbers in the parentheses uh, <clears throat> that follow the marking type um, 
are the expected service life range, so three to four uh, years for thermoplastic. And for every one of these, uh, as we all know, winters can be severe or mild, so to expect an exact uh, number of years service life is not realistic. So every marking type was given a range of uh, service years. At the second set of numbers following uh, the service life range, um, the numbers, again, following right here in the parentheses, are the annualized cost for that marking for those service years. So for a three-year service life from thermoplastic would be a 35 cent per linear foot. Uh, for the four years of service would be 27 cents per linear foot. And all these costs are based on a four-inch wide marking. And I, uh, I'd also like to point out uh, while I'm on this slide that one of the other uh, deliverables for this was electronic copies of these tables. And there's an Excel, a separate Excel lookup table that actually has the current costs for the, uh, these types of markings. So the DOT can update those costs to current uh, day's costs and then it will auto um, correct all these annualized costs so they can have current expected annualized costs. So in this example, I've just moved over uh, to the recess column, but all factors are the same. Same contract type, pavement type, climate zone, and traffic uh, category, but the list shown are the options for, the, of course, the recess markings. So as seen by the numbers shown in parentheses, placing these markings in a groove uh, extends the life of every marking as well as lower the annualized costs. And costs, again, shown include the cost of cutting the groove. So while the installation cost is higher to add the groove for the marking, there's obviously a, a return on investment. Due to the uh, large return on investment uh, for adding the groove to a new concrete surface, so moving on to the next matrix, uh, placing a marking on the roadway a surface on higher ADT roadways in northern and, and central Illinois was not recommended. So that's the only main difference between the striping on new asphalt versus new concrete. So the uh, only difference moving on to uh, maintenance striping uh, for um, asphalt surface roadways, we've uh, included uh, a, a distinction between whether the marking is being placed on um, a pavement with uh, just a few years service life versus uh, longer service life. You would not want to place you know, a, a marking that's more expensive or has a, a longer service life, uh, if it's going to last longer than the, the pavement uh, surface itself will be. So the, the difference here is, or the, the threshold, if you will, is uh, five years for an asphalt surface roadway. And then the final uh, selection table for concrete, maintenance striping on concrete surface roadways, that threshold value is, is 10 years. So pavements with less than 10 years uh, you would select markings from these two columns, and if it's greater than 10 years, from these two columns. So as shown by uh, these selection tables, if or when uh, IDOT chooses to implement a pavement marking management system, the state could fairly, fairly easily use the service lives provided in the guide to implement the expected uh, service life maintenance method. So the, pe the second pavement marking uh, management example comes from the Florida Department of Transportation. And the maintenance method represented is measured retroreflectivity, in which pavement markings are replaced after assessing measured retroreflectivity values. So FDOT's interest in pavement marking management began in 2002 after a customer survey in which several of the uh, elderly drivers that were surveyed expressed concern with the guidance of roadway markings. So following that, um, the DOT purchased their first MRU in 2004. They've continued to refine their MRU capability since then. And then in 2009, developed a calibration uh, bay at their facility at the State Materials Office in, in Gainesville. And then in 2012, they completed their development of their pavement marking management system database. 
And then since 2014, uh, they've had a statewide contract to collect um, payment markings, um, and ARA happens to be the, the current statewide uh, contractor. So a little more background on you know, why this is uh, important to the state of Florida. Uh, and, and first of all, it, it, for one, it also is the, has the third highest uh, population of all the states in the U.S., so be more traffic. And a significant percentage of that is the, the first statistics we're showing here. Um, in 1970, the population of drivers that were 65 years old was around 14.6. So you can see that that's, that's grown considerably, and, and they expect by 2040, uh, the number of drivers that age and older will be uh, more than 24 percent. But why is that important? Um, the driver's needs as, as they get older, um, the driver's needs for, for light doubles every 13 years. And the graph here to the right kind of depicts this. So you can see that, uh, that this is nearly exponential. The After 59 years of age, it increases the need for um, the additional light to view with markings uh, goes up considerably. So FDOT also, um, in, in their uh, process of getting their payment marking management system set up, uh, classified three different categories of, of payment markings based on retroflectivity. So the first the highest classification would be um, good, and these are values, retroflectivity values greater than or equal to 250 millicandelas. A category of failed, excuse me, of fair would be 150 to 250, and then poor or fail would be less than 150. So this slide is presented to show the uh, MRU units that are uh, the, the DOT uh, uses uh, for their quality assurance, and then ARA's unit happens to be the the same, but. These mobile uh, retrospectometers, you know, follow the same method as a handheld unit. We're just on a mobile platform. These particular units uh, have the laser scan at a, at a frequency of 400 hertz, so that's 400 readings of the uh, laser per second. I'll start a little animation that's included here. So you can see in the image on the right, uh, this is the uh, just a simulation of the laser scanning, and that distance is about uh, a meter. So this is uh, very uh, useful. It allows uh, the drivers of the vehicle to essentially uh, keep the vehicle safely uh, within the center of lane and still get the, the data needed. Uh, again, because of the frequency of the scan, the uh, vehicle can travel at posted speed limits. and um, the other benefits are that it's continuous data collection, of course, compared to having used handheld units, and there's there's no need for maintenance of traffic. And then in the image at the bottom, the animation here is, is simply showing uh, that the measurement is complying with the 30-meter geometry, and of course it's all um, at a smaller scale, in this case a one-fifth scale of 30-meter geometry. So the statewide program is a full-time year-round program. The data collection cycle begins April 1st of each year and is completed on or before March 31st. Uh, the total number of uh, lane miles of markings collected per year includes 100% of their centerline markings, which is about 12,000 lane miles of the 25,000. Now there's the sampling of the white skip and edge line markings, which constitute about 8,000 of the total 25,000. And then the remaining 4,000 are uh, to, to uh, provide you know, the data needed for research or, or safety or any, any special district needs that come up. So the staff that it takes to keep the program running uh, include, of course, the statewide um, data collection contract, which um, ARA has an engineer who's the data specialist and two uh, field technicians that are collecting the data uh, weekly and year-round. The, the second group of staff is their quality assurance consultant, 
And this is uh, one engineer who's the specialist and one field technician who performs the QA data collection. And I'll describe more about what this quality assurance testing is in upcoming slides. But then the third um, member of this, this team would be the program manager. So while the program manager um, has other duties, the, the first five that I mentioned are full-time, 100% dedicated. So it's a, a five full-time, uh, five-person group that, that uh, keeps the payment marking management system operational and with good quality data. So the Florida DOT uh, did an excellent job making preparations to implement a payment marking management system. And in the next two slides, I'll briefly describe two documents dealt, uh, developed uh, during those preparations. Now, when starting this program, there was no national or international standard. So FDOT developed uh, the Florida test method, FM5-600, uh, to standardize equipment, terminology, calibration procedures, operation procedures, and reporting format, and precision requirements. And for example, and I don't have time to review all of these, but for one example, uh, the, gra the graphic provided here depicts the standardized nomenclature for the different types of longitudinal marking lines. The so EL is the designation for edge lines, CL for center lines, and 1SL and 2SL for the skip line number one and skip line number two respectively, and R before the designation indicates ascending milepost and an L indicates descending milepost. So this, this test method also describes the required frequency for uh, the statewide contractor equipment uh, verification, testing, and calibration. And the quality assurance uh, for the mobile retrofectometer units, um, the, excuse me, the guide, they're the guide that actually provides uh, descriptions for the procedures for, for those testing. Uh, there's a number of different equipment uh, inspection and calibration requirements, and it also includes an operator uh, com competency uh, test. So FDOT verifies uh, the statewide contractor's uh, equipment through uh, this series of lab and field testing. Uh, to ensure their retroflectivity data is, is collected with the highest possible quality. So the DOT verifies, so here's where you're going to learn the stats of, of what the quality assurance, the actual uh, collection and comparison of the data is. The DOT uh, verifies 20% of the statewide data collected uh, by the contractor and tools um, have been developed to manage the data quality, as you see in the screenshot here. But a running mile average comparison uh, is used uh, when comparing the contractor to the DOT's data. So for the first criteria, if the running mile comparison agrees within plus or minus 95 millicandelas for more than 70% of the miles surveyed, the, the data is accepted, but if not, then 100% of that entire week's uh, survey must be recollected. Uh, for the second criteria, uh, any running mile comparison that disagrees, uh, just the running mile comparison disagrees by more than 75 millicandelas uh, must be recollected. And if the comparison uh, disagrees by for more than 30% of the roadway, the actual roadway section, then that entire roadway must be uh, collected. So the screenshot here, is uh, the macro that was developed to perform these comparisons. So you can see it makes it pretty quick and uh, simple to make those comparisons. But this is an example. Um, you see the DOT data is in, in black and the contractors in green. And this is an example of a comparison that passed. And any failed sections would appear in this, this window to the, the left here. So while the DOT pavement marking management system doesn't currently uh, contain installation data uh, as, such as material type and installation date, and I, I know that's a goal of the DOTs, but uh, this data uh, quality tool can also be used to review and compare 
uh, retroflectivity trends with historical data to try to determine um, that if um, marking showing something an increase, it's, that's an indication of where um, some striping has occurred. So here's an example, similar to the previous slide, but comparing three years of historical data. So rather than entering in these cells here, the DOT QA data and the contractor data, three sets of the same location, but different years evaluation are entered. <clears throat> so you can see that the striping was apparently, it was uh, replaced between 2014 and, and 15 because of the increase. And then there's been some degradation occurs uh, between 2015 and 16, as you see in the 2016 in black, the values have started to come down. So once the data is approved through the QA process, it is loaded into the DOT's pavement marking management system. So the data was originally provided in a SharePoint site, as, as shown here, but today it is available online and open uh, to the public to use. So one just needs to create an account uh, to get access to this portal. And again, if interested, feel free to write me and I can help you do that. <clears throat> But in this next slide, uh, the next several slides, I'm going to go over um, an example of uh, a query that's been performed. So first of all, the, the main screen here, um, this, is, this is the query tool that the districts can use to determine where they, they need to restripe. But there's still um, a variety of, of searches that they can do. So you can select which district you're interested in, which roadway system you might be interested in, uh, the, the year of the report survey, as well as counties, um, and different line types, so on and so forth. You could do any combination of these or just one or several. So for this example, the 2017 survey was selected for Alachua County. So this screenshot shows what that query looks like. The, so you see several rows here. and. In each row, well first, you can see this is Alaska County and this is the 2017 survey. So in each row here is a different uh, roadway within Alaska County. And the values in the columns to the right represent the average value for that entire line of that roadway. So there was data available for the, the descending uh, center line direction for this roadway as well as data in the ascending first skip line. So those that are not highlighted are in the good condition, have a value greater than 250, and those that are yellow, highlighted yellow, are in fair, 150 to 250, and anything red, of course, is then on the poor, less than 150. So the next screenshot here shows one specific route. You can see the route ID is all the same but the begin and end mile posts are 10th mile intervals. So now rather than just knowing whether or not the entire route uh, has failed, you can see within specific sections within that, that route what has failed or what is passing. So again, the same color coding for uh, those that are in fair condition or yellow and failed or red, and those that are good or not highlighted. And this exact same data is presented uh, in a graph this is in red, the descending center line, and in green, the ascending first skip line. Same data, just presented in a graph, so you can compare the two visually. So there's also, in the query tool, a mapping function. So what's been selected here is a couple different uh, selections. One is showing a specific route that was selected. And the rest of what you're seeing here is a report of the entire uh, average of all markings within each county. So just one county uh, has the average value for all of its, its lines to be in poor condition. The vast majority were in fair, uh, 150 to 250, and then a handful where the, the average for the entire county was greater than 250. So that route that was selected in the previous slide, uh, I zoomed in here so you can see it closer. This is a tool that allows you to look at just one 
uh, road way section if you're interested. So of course, because of the blue highlight, you can't see whether it's red, yellow, or green. So once you get to uh, this screen, you can then deselect that line. And this is zoomed out a bit, but this line right here on the left side of the, the state park shows that it is uh, yellow, so it's in the uh, fair condition. So besides the uh, query tool, which allows the districts to determine uh, which route they need to restrike, the DOT also uh, it <clears throat> puts all the data into a, a SQL database and performs you know, an annual statewide report, and that's what you see here. So for whichever year this was, uh, we're reporting all of the center, skip, and edge for the primary interstate toll and turnpike roadways, and of course, all systems combined. So you can see for all these lines and all these road types, all of them were in fair to uh, good condition. However, if you look down at the table, uh, this row at RL is less than 150, there are still uh, considerable percentages that uh, were in the, the poor condition. So moving on to the next slide, the DOT has uh, monitored the number of uh, roadways that are in that deficient condition, and we're just showing here starting in 2016 to 17, but you can see over time how the number of deficient lines for center, skip, and edge have decreased. Uh, they're actually projecting that in the 2019-2020 year to be even less. So with this payment marking management system, uh, the districts are able to make data-driven decisions as to where they need to restripe. And then based on, on these results, it's, it's shown here, it's, it's working very well for the Florida DOT. So in summary, I reviewed what a payment marking management system is and why it's important, and then shared a couple examples of different approaches to payment marking management. I, I hope you've gained uh, something from this presentation, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Carmen. That was uh, excellent. A topic that a lot of people really haven't connected with, uh, but I, I think the uh, attention in this area is going to continue. So I've got a, a few things. This is Jerry again, um, kind of cleaning up uh, some items. Number one, give you a bit of a preview of the upcoming ARA webinars. And uh, we try to provide a, a pretty diverse range of topics for really different disciplines and specialty areas within the overall transportation system. On November 20th, uh, Bob Buccieri from one of our California offices is going to give an in-depth discussion on crashworthiness, design, and the testing of passenger rail vehicles. And Bob and some of his colleagues have international reputations in this area in terms of state-of-the-art research uh, related to that topic. On December 11th, uh, we're going to move to our Southern Division office, and Daniel Renfrew, who is an expert in blast protection, is going to be speaking on ballistic protection issues related to common building materials. And you'll note that Daniel, for perhaps some obvious reasons, is a bit incognito here, and that's done intentionally. So uh, we expect everybody to kind of share this information with your colleagues. Uh, we've got our programs organized really through March of 2020. And again, we'll continue with this uh, diversification of topics as we go forward. Next slide. We're almost wrapped up. Uh, so we want to talk about the uh, <clears throat> question and answers that have been received. And I've uh, thus far received four questions for Carmen. Uh, and Carmen was gracious enough to extend an invitation to you through uh, close of business this Friday to send her um, an email, ask questions. Please don't place them in the form of consulting questions, if you will, but general technical questions are always welcome and appropriate. So the first question, Carmen, we have is, uh, can you speak to for, with an MRU, is there a, what's a typical data collection rate uh, in miles per day? The, the typical miles per day is going to be heavily 
uh, dependent on the type of roadway you're surveying. Um, the, the fastest data collection you'll experience would be on interstates, um, but then when you're getting down into you know, more rural roads or especially uh, in cities where your, your travel speed is limited to the, the lower posted speed limits, it's going to be considerably less. Okay, and uh, you didn't, if you mentioned it, uh, kind of a related question on my own here is that are there particular weather conditions that kind of make data collection preferable uh, or is that not an issue? Yes, and, and that's an excellent question and it relates very heavily to uh, the, the need for the, uh, the quality assurance um, that the Florida DOT performs and that's that uh, marking retroreflectivity cannot be uh, red when the pavement markings are wet. So red, the water film, of course, changes that geometry that I described and would not be providing, if you collected it at that time, you would not be reporting the actual uh, retroreflectivity. So anytime there's rain, you have to wait uh, for the, the pavement surface to dry, which in, in some locations, if there's heavy tree coverage, the roads won't dry. Um, as fast, so yes, that can very much be a challenge, um, the weather conditions. There's also, if you're wanting to collect data in a, in a snowfall region and get re readings in the spring for where to restripe that year, you have to wait until a good rainfall has occurred to wash, um, you know, the salt from the, the, the winter um, maintenance operations to be washed off the road. Okay, we've got um, another question, uh, this one from Glenn, and Glenn wanted to know if there's a maximum speed uh, when you're using an MRU um, at which the data collection can be obtained. And, and you had one of your slides, you, you illustrated speed, but I didn't think it was presented in terms of a maximum. Yeah, so the answer would be um, it depends on which unit uh, you're using. So. Um, the Laser Lux G7, which we're we're using, is, is as well as FDOT, um, because of the the speed of the frequency at which that laser scans, uh, you can travel up to any posted speed limit. Of course, the faster you go, the fewer readings you're going to get per distance. But at 400 scans per second, you're still going to get a lot of uh, data points. So each scan is a reading. Uh, there, there are other uh, manufacturers and uh, of those units. You have the Delta LTLM, um, that's in the United States. Zentner is a company in, in Europe that a little over a year ago um, started selling their units uh, through a U.S. vendor. Um, and then I believe there's also one that um, might still be in a development. I'm not 100% certain on its status, but it was a bumper-mounted um, unit. So. Uh, I think uh, at least one of those can also uh, be uh, used and travel at, at highway speeds, but others may or may not. Okay, and so we've got two more questions that have come in, and, uh, and we have time, a few minutes left. If anybody else has questions, feel free to send them in. So the, the third question comes from Mary, and um, she was interested, other than Florida's use of the MRU data, uh, are there other agencies that have implemented it? Yeah, so, um, and for different reasons, um, and in my my experience or my interactions, um, I'm mostly aware of um, a couple toll authorities like the Illinois Tollway um, and the Penn Turnpike, but other state DOTs that use mobile um, retroactivity data, and again, for, you know, prob probably different purposes, but it would be uh, Kansas, uh, Michigan, uh, Texas, the uh, West, the state of West Virginia, and I'm also aware that the you know the state of California is uh, making plans to to do that themselves at some point. Okay, great. And last question, at least that I've received thus far, and and uh, those of you, when I say last question, I want to don't don't disconnect quite yet. I want to tell you how to get your PDH and certificate information just in a minute or so. So the last question is uh, specifically, maybe it's somebody from Illinois. Uh, has Illinois DOT implemented a pavement marking management system using the surface life in their marking selection guide? Just reading it verbatim. Hopefully that you understand the question. Uh, it, it, 
It's my uh, like last understanding. Um, they don't currently have one, um, but again, as, as shown in my slides, uh, with the data that they got from the, the guide that we provided, uh, they've got a major uh, component of what would be the uh, service life maintenance method for a managed system to be implemented already okay. handy to them. That was, that was an easy one. Huh? So next mm -hmm. slide, please. We're almost finished, gang, and we're right on time almost. Okay, so uh, you are uh, eligible, those of you who've been on the uh, program for the last hour or so, 55 minutes, therefore, uh, can request a PDH certificate, a copy of the presentation, and a uh, PDF file is available. We don't provide copies of the PowerPoint slides themselves for obvious intel, um, intellectual property reasons. So please send, uh, <coughs> send a request through ARA webinars at ARA.com. And then last but not least, so we're always looking for great people. Uh, it's a wonderful market today for engineers and scientists. So if you're interested in employment, finding more about ARA, uh, please look at the information that's provided in slide 57. On behalf of Carmen, myself, and the entire ARA community, we want to thank you for joining today's program. Have a blessed day and thank you.